Welcome everyone to the POM and Leg Dog Show. If I'm the POM by process of elimination and through all of last week has been live every week, you should have an analytical mind. You should be able to work out that the guy next to me is Leg Dog. Leg Dog, how are you doing? Uh, mate, I'm bloody excited. I think well-earned rest last week, Pommy. Happy birthday for yesterday, by the way, mate. Happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, it's good to be here. as well. You're looking great. It's that new Looney Tunes t-shirt uh, jump that you got there? Mate, I'm just uh, bringing it back, mate. I'm bringing the, the, the 80s, 90s back one day at a time. That's no, good. We're back. We're going to run through the teams. We've taken a look. Pom, you've pulled together the, the average media rankings of these teams. We're going to pull them apart and talk about uh, how the, we're going to be trying to be positive. So we're going to talk about how what needs to happen for all these moves to work for their respective clubs. Spawn, so the process of the day really is we're going to review what the teams did in the trade period and try and be a bit more pragmatic. Everyone likes to give A's to F's, but no one ever talks about how they could be an A. And as we know, every time this year, Essendon win the October Premiership, we're going to talk about how that could be a real Premiership or a real wooden spoon. And You'll see the ratings. So the ratings, what I've done is the Herald Sun ran a little thing where they had one of their list manager experts that they've just found off the street um, who presumably can count to 44. Um, and then they put it to you guys and goes of the fan base, a live running poll. And then the boys on Champs Data gave theirs. So I've done an average metric, zero being pants, 10 being life-changing. And the median for Adelaide was really average. And let's look at it. Burgess came in 14 and 20, the comp for Dodie. Future second came in from the Demons. Dodie McAdam, 24 and 27 went out. And like a face value, really, it's kind of like you didn't really lose anything, didn't really gain anything. Yeah, I, look, I, I'm, I'm a lot higher on the 5.5 for them than other people i think tom duday is a big loss but if we're talking for next year he wasn't going to be there for most of it he was injured i think he was the best free agent that moved what i do like is that they managed to get 20 and 14 in so they're going to hit the draft i don't think they need a lot to jump next year and i think they could potentially jump into the top four from outside of the eight and i mean chris burgess he's depth isn't he but those two picks are going to be handy and i don't think they're too far off anyway I, th I think, you know, what we talk about how to get this to a 10. Like, for me, I, I would, if I was rating this, I would say it's a six and a half. I, I think it's better than good. And the reason I say it's better than good, starting off with 24, 27, ending up with 14 and 20, with the talk they're going to target Geelong's pick um, with 14 and 20, which is probably speaking with what Geelong are looking at, that kind of sounds very likely, I think. Pick eight on the table, 20, 14, gives them a real good scope, Geelong, to have three bites at it. Presumably taking two picks in the draft anyway, Adelaide. Adelaide haven't got a huge list thing. I think if they manage to get up higher in that draft top 10, I think you could be looking at that as being a nine because in that pick eight, nine, they could get a Dodie replacement who's fit. Yeah, absolutely, they could. And, uh, you know, they, there's still options for them to add players to their list. There might be a, a warm body if they're desperate for that key defender or that third tall, but I'm, I'm with you. I think the upside for them is in their selections, getting in a really solid first-round pick, whether it's with 14-20 or upgrading. But I think natural progression is going to be their biggest ally, and we might look back at this and they'll go, oh, geez, they lost to him, do they? But they were pretty good without him because he's been injured a fair bit across his career. So I, I think I think they're going to jump up in the draft. I think you're right. And I think then we're going to go, shit, how did they get, I don't know, insert name here. <laughs> well, I mean, this could be one of them. If they go up and they say get maybe a Connor or Sullivan or someone, a natural Dodie replacement, it's a 10. But it could also flip the other way, and this could be a zero. We'll answer this from Chills. Your favourite mem memorable moment or comment this year, Let Dog? I'll go while you think. Probably when I broke Terry's third wall. 
uh, against Essendon when I said that Lewis Young spent as much time on Peter Wright as I did with my ex-girlfriend this year. <laughs> um, it's not often you break Terry's um, hard demeanour in a loss, but that, that's got me a lot of giggles. I don't know. There's been a few. I can't really think of one in particular. I think getting Harley Reid mixed up with someone else's name was pretty funny. <laughs> I think I think being – actually, I'll tell you what, in hindsight, going on fan cams after the Gold Coast game and being really happy with the performance, uh, even – because I remember everyone hated that first quarter, but I, even then I was like, something's different. The vibes are different. The ball's moving in a different way. So, um, But basically that and predicting every single trade that happened two, two weeks before they happened was pretty good. That was pretty good as well. I agree with Kai as well. That's what we're trying to do today as well, Kai. We're going to give you how that could be a zero – Oh, that could be a 10, because as you know, hindsight is a wonderful thing. We go on to Brisbane. So Brisbane, I thought, a bit like Adelaide, in a different end of spectrum. Adelaide are kind of coming into that beginning of always being a final side, young, exciting, hungry list. Brisbane seemed to consummately be the bridesmaid. So close, let so far. They brought in Dodie, brilliant. Randomly brought in Ryan, probably for banter. 39-54 and a future fourth. Um, they lost Gunston, no big loss. Tom Fullerton, again, not best 22. Um, a negligible pick, pick 61. They did give up their future second. Not many picks this year, it has to be said, because obviously they sold the farm last year. Um, only got three max list spots, so it's not like it's going to be a big thing. But as a trade period goes... I don't mind this one. They gave it a 6.5. I don't mind it. It did really address the needs, didn't it? They needed a defender, probably needed back up forward. Yeah, well, they definitely, they've been sort of toying with that back up forward, ruck type role. Fullerton goes out. Ryan comes in. He probably plays as much as Fullerton did, i.e. not heaps. Um, Gunston, again, wasn't available enough for them to make a huge impact. I liked that acquisition last year, but he just wasn't available, which makes it tough. And to me, their major issue was needing probably a third tall, and I think they got the best one that was available this year. You know, he's going to miss a chunk of time, and worst-case scenario is, you know, he gets injured again, and, and we're looking at this going, uh, it's probably a zero. But... To me, I think 6.5's unders. I think Tom Duday was the best player that moved in this off-season. I might need a asterisk to that and have a think about it. But in terms of free agents, he was the best that moved. Um, the best case scenario is he comes in and does exactly what he can do at his best, and then they win the flag. Like, really, their team isn't going to change heaps from grand final day. And I know they got beaten on grand final day, but gee whiz, they were good last year. There's... um. Big double dummy, you raise Ryan. I mean, Ryan, he's basically, like you say, he's, he's he's probably more of a fit for purpose Tom Fullerton at this stage. Probably suits what they are, what they're looking for in that role. This is one of them, isn't it, really, where this is going to be a 9 or a 10 if, if Dodi plays 20 games, right, next year, and they win the flag, 10. This could be one of them where also next year they've got Ashcroft guaranteed, who looks like he's going to be a top 10 talent at the worst. Hey. Do you know what I mean? Sam Marshall's a top 40 talent as well coming through next year. So draft isn't really important for them next year. They haven't really lost anything next year as well in the draft because the way the AFL system works, you could go in there with two Mars bars and a chip. Um, but this could be one of them where if Dodie, though, does keep his injuries and Fullerton, say, gets that opportunity, which you suspect he will at Melbourne, this could quite easily come down to a two. Because I think Brisbane are one of them teams that you're, they're the dogs of the top four. You have the doggies in the top eight all year. You don't know why. You'll have Brisbane in your top four, but you can't tell me why. Yeah, look, I think so. Just looking through Tom Duday's career, he's played six years in three of them. He's played 20-plus games. In the other three, one game, nine games, 11 games. So it looks like it could be a flip of the coin, but he is exactly what they need. Uh, and look, they're paying him pretty well because generated a band one comp uh, compensation. But I like it. I like what they've done. agree with you, though. There is some risk. I think they're good enough, though. Obviously, Ashcroft out next year as well. The other Ashcroft is out uh, next year with that injury. So 
there are some parts of that team that you got question marks over, but broadly, I think they're going to be competitive again. Talking about competitive, a team that's probably going into this season with the most pressure. I'd say Carlton probably have the most pressure because I'd say that that season probably was over expectation, which genuinely in the AFL media means the pressure rises. No one sees it that way. We've seen Melbourne when they overachieved um, very early doors. The media went mental on Melbourne the next year. Carlton had to probably add depth. I'd say Carlton didn't really have much expectation going into this. They lost two players, Dow and Fisher, who were, I think everyone will admit, were outside the best 25, um, came in with injuries. I think one of the big pluses for me, and the media seem to think the same, I think this is one of them ones where it's a 6.5, it's a wait and see. I think the big plus, though, for me is they converted pick 17 and then pick 69 effectively into two picks that are going to be used, where this time at the start of the trade period, you would have only used pick 17. And that gives Carlton movability upwards, gives them movability next year if they want to. And also they got the future fourths in, which we've seen in all the trades this year, are the state knives in deals for points next year as well. And Elijah Hollands, who is probably what we wish Dow was, I think Elijah Hollands is the hybrid of Dow and Fisher, someone who can play on the ball but could also play half forward if we needed him. Yeah, look, I think this rating is about right. It's about 6.5. How does it work out? They convert their future first 22 and 26 into an earlier pick and they get some sort of superstar or they get really lucky at 22 and 26. It works. The part that does work, funnily enough, for sure, is the future force because that's one of our father's sons next year locked in. So, funnily enough, the steak knives and the worst bits of our ends are actually the most reliable one. Pick 22 and 26, we're not sure what's going to happen there. And Elijah Hollands, obviously, the worst case scenario is that he gets suspended for doing dumb stuff and never plays. That's worst case scenario. That's how this becomes a zero. But how it becomes a 10 is that he makes his way into that senior team. We go to the draft. We hit it. We we nail a couple of picks as Carlton fans. When you look at the ins and outs on a whole, it's basically one of Dow or Fisher went out if for a second round pick coming in. Basically, that's all we did. Uh, I keep saying we because I'm a Carlton fan, which is solid. Like that's probably what it's worth. I'd say Elijah Hollands is an upgrade on Dow and Fisher just because of a salary and b age more than anything. His ceiling may be the same as Paddy Dow or Zach Fisher's. I suspect it's higher, but again, they are they weren't in our best 23. He doesn't have to be. I suspect he will be pushing for it uh, come the middle of next year. I agree, and I think this is going to be one of them ones that, again, 2020, 22 and 26, you could seek out and sneak into the top. We know Geelong have doubled down this week and said that that pick is on the table. You'd imagine Carlton have been quite open. They want to get as close to the first round as possible. Um, I did think Nick Austin's comments at the end of the draft, and I agree with him, who they rank 15 to 30 is the same, same player. Mm. So it's obvious there that Carlton are quite happy to take them two picks. They've only got two list spots on the senior list with two upgrades to go. So you'd imagine two players are going to get upgraded, two are going to be using this, and maybe a delisted free agent in the Mickey Mouse draft at the end of the year. But this is going to be one of them ones that, like you say, if Elijah Hollands displaces David Cunningham or Lockie Fogarty and kicks 25 goals next year and runs in the midfield and gives them a point of difference, it's a 10. If Elijah Hollands doesn't play and Paddy Dow goes on to all Australian or Zach Fisher does, it's a one. Mm. It's, again, one of them where we're backing in the system and like the other two teams, backing in their eye. I think the thing is, Carlton had no major deficiency they could address in this one off season. So they've, what they've done is they've actually got rid of two guys who they were having to pay to not play to create opportunity to bring young players in. They actually didn't have it to address anything majorly in the in the off season. So in that sense. It's a it's been a it's been a solid off season. I think their progression will come in the development of your Jackson Binzers and more growth in the system that Vosky's is building and stuff. I don't think we, this draft specifically is going to affect next year in any significant way. Yeah, I agree with double double dummy. It's a very safe thing, and 
I want to talk about that with Collingwood. Carlton would have to totally bottom out here um, with them picks. Yeah, um, we'd have to along. draft Cle- Clem Smith and Dylan Viojo Ramo and those sort of guys. I think we're behind that. but And I think it's interesting, Collingwood and Carlton, and we come on to Collingwood, I think both of them have had a very good... When you look at the ins and outs... It makes sense. So Ginny, I think, is a bit of a loss from a culture standpoint in the terms of he was a fan favourite. I think it's I think Ginny going out is bigger than what it is in reality, just because he was so popular and polarizing. He's a player. Taylor Adams, I think, is a great out because he wasn't playing his best role. I think they've got fair value. Schultz is a major upgrade on Ginny. Huge upgrade. They've managed to get the 39 pick. They've got it 33, so that's gone up. Yes, they've given away a future, but they're not we're gonna find anyone around that 39 pick as good as Lachlan Schultz in this year's draft. And they've also really got that first back and that second back from Hawthorne, because Hawthorne are gonna be that bottom seven, eight area, so they're not gonna to lose too many places. I think Carlton and Collingwood just quietly have had really sensible trade periods and no one's really getting excited about it. Yeah, I think they've got Finlay McRae, who they're probably looking at to be that Taylor Adams midfield replacement. They got rid of Giddy. They bring in Schultz, who's a massive upgrade and gives them quite a long runway of, of really deep forward production. I'm with you that the difference in the picks if they project out the way you think they're going to, are massively different. So, I mean, to me, this is already close to a 10 just because you're the reigning premiers and you've improved your best 23. And I'm not sure if there's any way it can become a zero, Pom. I just don't see any world where, like, even if they came dead last for some reason, it's still a win. It's just, I just don't see how this could turn out badly. Well, I mean, it becomes a 10 if they go back to back, Lachlan Schultz adds 35 goals to his game. Which you'd think he's going to, right? Which, <laughs> which you would. I would say the zero, though, would be, it's always interesting, I find, when a player comes from a crap club. No offence to Fremantle, but Schultz is the breadwinner in that forward line. He's going to go to a Collingwood team that is very team-oriented. They have a great spread. Bobby Hill flying at the moment, the back end of the season. And then Ginny. If Ginny goes to Hawthorne, and suddenly makes good on his skills. They get a few injuries in the midfield. Taylor Adams stays fit and dominates in the midfield of Sydney. That's one of them ones where you may look and go, they've backed in the young boys, and rightly so. They've got some real good young boys coming through their VFL. But if suddenly they have a couple of injuries in the midfield, they're bringing in the kids, they get overrun. That's probably where you start to question it if Taylor Adams is kicking ass and taking names at Sydney. Which I think he will, but uh, yeah, I'm with you. I think I think there is there are some dominoes that could fall and make this a zero, but I think there's quite a lot of dominoes to get through first. But our first four teams, I think, all pretty good tread periods, pretty standard. Yeah, I, I think all of these are probably a bit underrated in terms of the rating they got. I think people probably aren't looking... I'm not sure what they look at when they measure these, if it's next year or the long-term future, because I think there's arguments for all these to be high upside. Uh, Mate, I, I, I've got them a bit higher in, in yeah, my me mental too. mental things, but here we go. As you know, the media have frothed it, and when Let Dog says he wants to know what they're looking at, you probably look at the ins. That's what it is. It was the fact mm. that they got to write something in the tweets is what they gave. Yeah, that's true. Oh, and- it's probably a ranking on how much media clicks they were able to generate. That's why Essendon's so high here. Spoiler alert. I'm not going to be as high on them. But but Essendon went mental. Uh, Xavier Dersmer, Jay Gresham, Todd Goldstein, which would have been a great acquisition if it was 99. Ben Mackay, 31-61 and a future fourth came in from Collingwood. Brendan Zerg Thatcher, D'Ambrosio, pick 52-73, future third and future fourth. Media have loved this. Um, Harold Sun gave it a 7.5. This is one of them for me, which is why it goes back to Kai's point. Just because they've got a lot of ins, all of them players, uh, if only players, maybe players, 
They could be good players. We're backing in. They've got a new scenery. They're going to get good. If they stay the level that they are and we're still having this conversation next year, it's a zero because they have eaten their salary cap. And the only win here is they managed to get Jed Gresham's comp pick back somehow. <laughs> yeah, well, basically. For, for me, I'm giving them a... I'll give them a 5.5 on, on the rating scale because they did improve their best 22 because Goldstein is going to be better than Andrew Phillips was. Ben Mackay is going to be better than BZT was. Jade Gresham is going to be better than a Will Snelling and Dersma is going to be better than a, whoever the hell else you want to throw in there. Slightly. So I'm going to give them a 5 4 because they have improved their best 22, but it does feel like a Carlton mid-rebuild, let's go get Jeremy McGovern, let's go get Jack Martin, let's go get Zach Williams, that sort of play where you're. In, these guys are probably maxed out on, on their potential. Maybe Dersma has a bit to give, but I've seen Gresham. I don't like what he's got. Goldie's 370 years old and Ben Mackay is what he is, and that's an average, probably below average key defender. Their path to a 10 is not that these guys get better. It's that these guys do their roles and the youth under them, your Ben Hobbs and your whatnot, they're the ones that step up and drive the club's success. I think you saw that with Carlton this year. It, well, Jeremy McGovern isn't the reason that we were playing really well. Jack Martin, well, maybe less so, isn't the reason we were playing well. It's that everyone finally gelled all at once and they were sort of complementary to the rest of the team. I think we're going to look back and see similar with this. If the rest of their team kicks on, this will look like a good trade period. If they don't, which I would argue history says that Essendon don't develop amazingly well with their players, we're going to go, what the hell did they do spending 20% of their salary cap on Durs, McGresham, Goldstein and Mackay? There is, and I think Christian knows it. It's a lot of vanilla players. Um, presumably, they say they've still got cap space. I mean, this is going to be one. I'm going to go on a limb here, right? Two of their long-term deals here won't be there in 2025. Oh, I like that. I, I, I reckon they have fallen subject to the long-term deals, and I reckon it will backfire. And do I hope I'm wrong? Not really. But no. expected to take free picks. Um, obviously, as Christian rightly says, draft hand hasn't changed too much. 9.31.35. Probably all going to be taken at the draft. I do think, though, for me, I think D'Ambrosia, they're going to live to regret that. I, I genuinely believe that when I look at Essendon's best 22, I feel it lacks points of difference. And I feel that D'Ambrosia has a point of difference. I also look at BZT and I look at that back line and now they've just got rid of, it feels like what was a really undersized back line now has a berm off in Ben Mackay, but he isn't fit all the time. And they've lost an intercept player in BZT and not replaced him. So presumably pick nine is going to be that player, which is Connor O'Sullivan. So, yeah, I, I just feel this was this weird strategy. Xavier Dersmus, the only one, honestly, in my heart of hearts, is the only one that I rate. I think there's a reason all these players were available, which we've talked about with Carlton for three, four years now, Pom, that great, we got these guys, they were available. Why were they available? And there's a reason for every single one of these players as to why they were available. So, again, it could be the death knell and it could have realised in a couple of years that we've absolutely fucked it, like we can't recover, we can't financially recover from this. <laughs> But I think likely we just see all these players just do exactly what they've previously done and Essendon need to hope that everyone gets better around them. I don't, yeah, and I think D'Ambrosio would be nice to have in their team, but uh, uh, they didn't understand the rookie rules apparently. So there you go. I, I genuinely think the media has gone mental on this and I would actually, at face value, it's one of them that's deceptive. It looks good because of the in column. And yes, they are best 22. But I just feel like all three of them players have massive questions for me. Massive Jism questions. Jism 87 asks, do we still see them moving up the draft order? Prior to the trade period, I had them moving down. And I probably still do. I think their team's better. I just don't, I think it's 2% better rather than, which is probably not what you want with your four acquisitions. 
I'm just one of them people that when you're rebuilding like they are, you don't want questions. And enjoy your dinner, double dummy. Enjoy your dumb. Um, we're coming on to hot soon, so enjoy that, mate. No, I'm with you. I just think when you're rebuilding, you don't want to take on someone else's risk. For me, Jade Gresham's the type of player that a Carlton and Adelaide would take on and go, if we can get him right, he fires us further. But we've got the players if he stays where he is. I mm. feel that they are hoping he they need him to be 10 out of 10. They need Ben Mackay to play 25 games a year. I, I don't guarantee it. I agree with Albert. I think it's a big risk. Big risk. Me too. Me too. And if so. it goes wrong, because I'm a Carlton fan. I think they've fan, been overrated. If he, if, because I'm a Carlton fan, I'll touch myself. Um up next, Fremantle. Now, the media hated this one. I actually think that this is high because <laughs> I, I, I'd give them a one. Where the rest have been too low, this sheet here, I think they have been too ambitious. And Me too. If Essendon are the October premieres, Fremantle have just won the first coach to be sacked race because he, he ain't seeing the bye. Now, I know there's the argument, the two future first, but look at who them teams are, Port Adelaide and Collingwood. They're going to be gash picks next year. Do you know what I mean? That, unless one of them massively capitulates, that's not going to be good. St Kilda, you suspect they steady, so they're going to be mid-table um, type picks anyway. They brought in 34, but I look at the team players they've lost. Schultz, world-class. Henry, that back-end form, questionable, Right? Because was that just to get a contract? Because we'd never seen that from him. But definitely best 22 at Fremantle. Hamlin, I know Fremantle fans are saying he's no big loss. Big depth player, though, at the very worst. Not a great amount of picks this year as well in this draft. When you look at Fremantle, 34, 46, 60, 64, because they went mental on Jackson. This is one of them things where this could be a zero, if they have injuries and have to do a West Coast Eagles and get Peel players to play. And then you're hoping next year the players fall. Yeah. Uh, I mean, no surprises. I'm not very excited about this one. I think given the circumstances and given the way player movement works in the AFL, they, they did their, they got the best they return they could have. Schultz demands that he has to go for family reasons. He nominates the reigning premiers. And you get a first and a second out of him or whatever the deal was. That's not nothing. Liam Henry, you managed to get some decent return out of, which is a guy who you were almost going to delist in the offseason, then Hamley loses as well. So I think given what they could have done, they did all right. But for next year, obviously they're going to be worse. And... As much as I love you, Demo, I don't love the best 23 that are available to Frio. You sent us a team sheet the other day, which filled me with dread. Um, the way it turns into a 10 is that the, the picks work out and they draft some guns and no worries. But it's going to be much easier for it to stay at a zero. And, and the worrying thing is, and I'm not as worried ever as everyone about oh, how many players are leaving Freo, no one's coming in, blah, 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 because they're clearly having to transition now into drafting and basically rebuilding, which is fine. But I, I, it does worry me that two of these guys were best 22 and they probably don't have those replacements available to them right now straight away. And I don't think they're going to draft them this year. Yeah, I agree. And I think the feedback is um, Chills ass. Did they go too quickly signing Gretchen and Fenn to get Shiel in? That that feels like what Essendon did do wrong. And I do feel like Gresham is another Shiel. Looks really good. Long term could kick you in the arse, which the rumours were they were trying to get rid of him. As for Fremantle, I'm with you here that I'm not so worried about them losing players. But I just feel that when you're going into the draft with next to no picks... The rumours from Fremantle are they're going to be signing mature age players. Mm. Then I look at their list makeup and I'm thinking, you're signing mature age players, you're going into the draft with really the picks when all the top talent is gone, right? You've got the second youngest list in the AFL now, the, the second exper least experienced one. Surely you could have brought something in. Like, like, 
and you're backing next year's draft. And I'm a firm believer, unless it's a father, son or an NGA, it's always bad to do that because so much can happen from now till then. You're sometimes better getting what you can now and what you know, better the devil you know. And Fremantle are in that horrible position that if they fuck this rebuild, and I agree with Anthony and um, Jay, if they do an old school GWS or a Carlton, you haven't got time with Tasmania around the corner. This this could be disaster zone. Yeah, it could be. It could be bad. Uh, they're going to need to nail. They're going to need to nail a couple of delisted free agents and mature agents. But for me, I'm just, yeah, I don't know. Uh, they're not going to the draft this year. They're banking on next year's draft. Hopefully, that works out. But for me, this is a long. This it, again, they did the best they could with the hand that they were dealt, but. Short term and long term, they're worse off. Mate, I agree. And uh, Kai, going back to my previous question, it'd be interested to see the range of w- ratings, worst case to best case. Yeah, we took an average on there. Um, I'll, I'll read them out as we go because I've got the sheet up. But Geelong, Geelong are the most interesting one. So the range here that the AFL media gave, you got a 5.5 there. Um, it's 6 to 3.5. So I'll let that sink in. The lowest anyone gave them was 3.5. I think that that guy was spot on. Uh, six, Absolutely. I think, is an overestimate. This is a really interesting one for me. Radically left, right? And it was exactly for that 25, 76, 94. They confirmed they wanted them to promote Category A players. So that makes sense. Do you know what I mean? That makes sense. Suspected, though, and it's interesting that they're going to make four to five. They've got quite a few list spots, but four to five changes. So two of them category A, that's three. We've only picked 25 being a pick that presumably is usable and pick eight. I would say it's a lock these guys trade eight. I would say this trade period is guaranteed they have to because Geelong, one of the older lists, they need that youth in. And I think their list is primed to maybe not take a top 10 player and go for three bites of the 20s. Yeah, unless there's one really specific player they want that they desperately want in the top 10. I think they've shown enough capability historically at the draft to t- exactly that, to take a couple of 20s and 30s and find some gems, which is what I would be doing with them given the list holes that they have and given the situation there. This can't be higher than a 3.5 because... There's no upside really in pick 25. Pick 25 may as well be pick 35. And Asava Radigalia was played 16 games for them and they lost him and they don't have anyone that I can think of that comes in as an immediate replacement. So for me, they got worse So and there's no upside in what they brought in. So their upside is, I guess, if they can combine, use that pick eight to trade up, but that's not related to this conversation. So... Maybe we'll review it differently at the end of trade period, at the end of draft period, and we'll go, geez, they did turn eight into X, Y, Z, and they signed the listed free agent ABC. But until that happens, this is 3.5 at best for me, at best case scenario. I, I have this as bad as Fremantles, to be honest, because I feel like me personally, I think if you are in a need for that, you need to get that trade done. I think it's a risk when you get to the draft to trade picks, I think it loses value when you're doing what they're doing. I think it loses value. It depreciates in value because by the time that they will come to trade their pick, people know what's on the board and you're backing in whoever eight is or 10 by the time the draft comes around with the match system. That That's someone people desperately want. I think they would have been better off getting it out of the way now while it's all up in the air. Dan Curtin now, North Melbourne, evidently don't have him in their top five selections. So then that creates a question. A lot of questions will be leading up to the draft. And if it goes that way, that pick will lose value. I think if Carlton had rang them, I think they might bite themselves because I don't think they'll get as good as 22 and 26 at the draft. But they probably need to do that. It's I agree. They have got worse. And like I say, this, this is as bad as Fremantles, in my opinion. Yeah, I... Did a, a ranking show uh, the other day on the Falcon Footy podcast, and I was very harsh on 
Geelong because they got worse after having their worst ever year in the history of their existence. Their, their draft pick eight is the lowest they will have ever draft, just to put it in perspective or whatever the pick is before all the compensation comes in. So, yeah, and they got worse. Yeah, I mean, I had them taking Nate Caddy, as um, Gazim says. I had them in my mock draft. I, I'll be very interested because it's a great acquisition for them. But then they'll take someone 25, which will blow out to 28, 29. I just feel that if I had three bites of the 20s, I think that their list could be more well-rounded. But we come on to Gold Coast, says his favourite team. Um, this is an interesting one because I think that this is... I, I actually think this is a masterclass. In my opinion, I think this is the second best. That's why we period. get along, Pom. We, we, we agree way too much on this show. We need to start having different thoughts. <laughs> But genuinely, I think this is the second best. I think they've absolutely blown it out of the water. Um, they've managed to get future first in next year. They've lost nothing, really. Maribor Chol never really worked for them. Um, they've got that salary pretty much off the books. Hollands, they've obviously got rid of him for a reason. Do you know what I mean? Fresh change of scenery. They were quite open. Burgess was borderline. And then they have monopolised the AFL's shit matching system helped other clubs out, got them all in, and somehow have a really healthy Arsenal next year. Dimmer will be looking at this very quickly and going, yeah, we've done well here. Yeah, and I saw Kane Corn suggesting in the mid-season trade period next year that uh, they'll trade for Dustin Martin just to add some cream to the crop. I'm Happy with you, be Pom. Good. They basically turned one pick into three, four, five academy players, three this year and potentially... Another couple next year. Chol was really good in his first year up there. Kicked 40-plus goals last year. Just either didn't buy in or couldn't get into the side or or who knows. He's gone now. They don't have to pay him. And Hollands and Burgess weren't playing too much senior footy for them. I, I'm with you. I think this is an absolute just – they've blitzed it. They've got multiple firsts next year. They've got academy players. They're going to be able to manipulate, get in front of those picks, jump behind them like – this is uh, – it's very rare that we talk about how well Gold Coast have done in the off-season. I don't know if they've had a change of staff or anything like that, but absolutely killed it. Yeah, and they're starting to win trades like Kai Nails. That We're going to talk about dogs in a minute because I was quite impressed that the dogs manipulated the system as well to get two picks. But it is a risk because it's in that finicky area, that pick, of will the player that they are so heavily linked with, Nick Watson – even be there with some of the news coming out from North. It's going to be, this is one of them ones that I think the lowest it will be rated in time is eight. Because what they've done is they're always getting them four boys. They're always getting Jake Rogers, Ethan Reed, Jed Walters, and presumably Will Graham has confirmed that he will be picked up in some source by the Gold Coast. So they've already had a better draft period before the draft period has started. Do you know what I mean, sir? Yeah, exactly. Th this is one of them ones that no one will really care. Like, it, you've won the trade period guaranteed. No, they've smashed it. Smashed it, smashed it. 6.5 is, to me, a clear lack of understanding on how the draft works and how they were able to turn pick four into... Just, I just to prove it's... Harold Sun's experts on the trade are stupid. The highest they rated them was a five... Mm, craziness that's a good question from rowan do you guys predict them for finals i haven't done any sort of predictions or ladder predictors yet my gut feel is probably not uh it depends how well you know jed walter and, and those sort of guys can come in and impact straight away which generally it's pretty hard for for first year players to do and i think chills has predicted what dimmer was doing uh definitely did that um i agree with jay as well it is time that they got in there. I, I think they're going to be about a 12th, 11th, 12th. Do you know what I mean? 11th, 12th side. Do you know what I mean? 11th and 12th side. Um, we're quick here, mate. We're quick here. Um, I'm not like Terry, who lets the chat go. I like to get in fast. But then we go on to GWS, who we usually... It's quite interesting. Now, counting out shit, or GWS. <laughs> Both teams were... Usually propping up the trade period, both were boring. Um, pick 43 came in for comp. Matty Flynn 
left. Um, obviously backing in the big Braden Proust dog. Um, he has to come right at some point. Um, this is an interesting trade, though, right? I'm just going to tell you. So the range that they gave them was a 4.5 to a 6.5. I don't know how one player out a comp pick in because you didn't really actually trade. This is my bug no. there. It's not really a trade. So technically it's a zero if I'm being pedantic. It has to be. It has but to be a zero. They didn't this do is going to be one. But... If pick 43, though, is like some kind of boffin we've never heard of, <laughs> And he ends up playing 300 games. Um, fucking huge 10. Yeah, that's the only way to attend. This is a zero because they lost a starting 22 caliber Ruckman for nothing. And like, we can't judge them on this because it hasn't happened, but they're going to sign a Ratio fant Fantasia. And anyone who does that gets a zero in my books. Not much to talk about GWS. I think Flynn, though, is a big loss. And I appreciate he wanted to play. They can cover him. Ah. They've got Briggs and Proust, and like that's fine. But you, to lose a, the, their issue is that he, Briggs was so good this year they couldn't play Flynn and get value for him. Flynn's better than pick forty three in the draft. I just yeah, I I just feel like yeah that Proust is a risk. I mean they have got Madden and Co coming through, but we move on to Hawthorne, who for me, I think won the trade period. Won Agreed. the trade period. I think their average rating in the media is seven and a half. I think that's bollocks. Someone gave them a five. Um, I, I don't know how. Um, I would say this is as close to a 10 as you presumably can get. Ginny came in. Gunston comes in. Huge in that. Shouldn't be understated. Chol came in, which I think you lose Kajitsky. I like Kajitsky, but I think Chol under the right guidance, could be a hell of a lot better. D'Ambrosio, I'm a big fan on. Um, the picks they got in, I really liked as well. Um, I don't think they lost anything important. They've got the first next year, which I think is important. They have also, no one's talking about it, with their picks, they have four, will also have a father-son locked to them. So that's two top 20 picks. Effectively, they've filled a lot of holes in this window. And they've still got work to be done. I think absolutely phenomenal again. Yeah, agree. So Brockman goes out. He was going at, uh, well, give me an average here, 0 0.9 goals a game this year. Guess how many goals Ginevan was kicking this year? 0 0.9 goals a game. He comes in to replace him. They lose Kaczynski, who's younger, but uh, maybe a Chol kicked 40 goals two years ago, four, kicked 44 goals, two goals a game. Two years ago, Gunson comes back as a bit of a mature body. Their forward line was probably where they needed a little bit of depth, and they've addressed that. Their starting forward line looks like it'll be Dylan Moore, Luke Bruce, Jack Ginevan, Mitch Lewis, G uh, Marbia Chol, and Jack Gunston, which is six very, very solid names. And then they've got a couple other guys floating around that can go through there. And then they've, you know, added some picks. And D'Ambrosio comes across. He should have been for free, but they were nice and they tra did the, the friendly trade when they actually didn't have to because he was a free agent, which I always hate, but that's what they did. Mate, this is the, the best off-season of the bunch. And I think people are talking about it. Dabo, like, we're going to come on to North. I think Hawks as well. People have got to talk about this. Hawks probably are the only club in the AFL that had a reason to get pissed off with the AFL just helping North Melbourne out and they haven't and they've gone to work and got busy and got busy and if they can bring in a Colby McKercher, a Zane Dursma, Riley Sanders, whoever that may be, plus they'll get big boy McCabe as well, which is a huge win. You'd imagine that they'll probably try and have some sniff around as well. Chew Giaf, who I do think suits them yes. as well. If they can end up with that, I think this is a win, huge win. Ah, oh, no, no questions about it. Needed forward depth, needed key forwards, and needed someone who could pinch it in the ruck, and they did it. And D'Ambrosio is just a nice little bit of um, extra bit, extra cherry on top because he can go in and. He can play on a wing. He can play on half back. He can 
he can solve a, a German MP issue. Not the German MP is bad or an issue, but he's an aging player and a really young team. So they're pretty, I mean, <laughs> what can you say? It's a very impressive. Mate, it's a good pick. And I agree with Dabba. I mean, I wouldn't have paid pick three for Ben Mackay. Um, we'll come yep. on to North Melbourne. And Ginny, I think Ginny's a really good thing. I think um, Sam Mitchell seems to get the best out of these young kids. You can see the culture has been changed there. We're they all slaves. seem to love him. And, and and he loves it. He loves Hawks. And as Let Dog says, lots of hashtag sleeve watch from Hawthorne this year. Um, can't wait to see that. Wingard and Ginny in the forward line. Yeah, hopefully Wingard can get back into the team towards the end of next year. I'm not sure how long that uh, Achilles was it. He's going to keep him out, but yeah. They do. They have um, a guy called Will McCabe. So Will McCabe is a father-son scheduled to go somewhere between 20 and 25. So they'll have two picks. Um, Melbourne. Melbourne, an interesting one because they're another team that is always the bride. I'm always the bridesmaid, never the bride. 6, 11, 42, and 93 at the draft. Obviously, 11 coming in through trades. McAdam, Fullerton, Billings, again, another speculative pick, but nothing really much came in. It didn't cost them anything. They did lose James Jordan, who's a bit of a nothing player. Harms, very good depth player. They finally got Grundy off the books, the ever-revolving salary of Brody Grande, 14 and 27 and 35 went out. They address needs in the loosest sense of the word, I feel. But this is one of them trade periods where, you know, when your nan used to say to you, sometimes if you've got nothing to say, it's better not speaking. <laughs> yeah. This is one of them ones that when we're talking about range, I know Kai keeps asking about range. This could be an eight out of 10 or a two. It, this is like literally I need to see McAdam, Fullerton and Billings play for me to have judgment. Yeah. I, look, I think, I don't think, I think Fullerton provides that forward ruck, which they were missing, but he's not, he doesn't have any pedigree really in terms of doing that, but he's probably a better option than Tom McDonald, who they tried to do in the final. So I get that. That's a tick. They don't have a backup Ruckman now unless he's the backup Ruckman. Shane McAdam presumably plays Melksham out for a period of time. Maybe he pushes Spargo or Neil Bullen further up the ground. I'm not sure. Billings, I don't, I'm not going to get around. I don't think he plays. Uh, he does provide depth with Harms and Jordan going out, but I don't think, I think he does the Luke Dunstan thing of, of not really playing. But yeah, for me, yeah. If they can manage to turn all these picks into, you know, pick one, whole different ball game, and that's your that's your path to a ten. At the moment, this is purely just a middle of the middle of the pack. Meh. I do like so they trade Brody Grundy. They don't have to pay his salary, and they actually end up getting a second rounder, I believe. Uh, when you take into consideration what they paid to get him into the club, and then what they got when he left, I think they ended up with a free second rounder for holding under Brody Grundy for a year. So. That's decent, but yeah, this is a very yeah. middle of the pack sort of trade period. Brody, Brody Grundy is becoming the Bitcoin of the AFL, isn't he? <laughs> uh, Bitcoin investment. It, it's an interesting one. I mean, like you say, they convert their two first and they get pick one in the unlikely occurrence. Huge win, huge win. But I mean, I look at this Billings, this is how the AFL has sold it. The media have really rated this trade period. But they've gone Billings, 11th hour trade, covers the loss of Harms. I would personally rather have Harms and Jordan on my list than Billings mm -hmm. because Billings is – my issue with the AFL and these trades is people get too blindsided with could be good or when he's played, he's been good. When he's played. Like, if he's depth, for me, availability is the best ability in them situations. Yep. Yep, and he's not available. And he couldn't break into St. Gilda's team. And I don't see why he would break into Melbourne's team. <laughs> Chills, it'd be a nightmare if you uh, are his next-door neighbour. Yeah, You won't want to be mates with him for very long because he'll be fucking moving. Um, North Melbourne, um, the AFL media really did like this. And because the AFL media is a bit like... 
Is this rude? To, can you get counseled for this? I'll say it anyway. The AFL media have rated this anywhere from a nine to a seven, right? And uh, it's a little bit like the AFL media does a little bit like if the AFL is like North Korea and the AFL media is North Korea's press, <laughs> they are they have to say it's good because they have orchestrated this trade. Now, I'll say this. Goldstein leaving, nothing. Nothing. It, 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 they needed to put time into Zeri and the younger guys because they went through a stage two years ago of just drafting rooks. So let's see one of them. Um, ben Mackay, I don't mind that because I feel like he hasn't played enough games to warrant that. As Dabo says, pick three. Fuck me. Yes, get rid of him for pick three. Um, Zach Fisher comes in. I like that trade for them. I think that that was something they needed. Bigoa. My favourite trade. We got all excited about that. Only that and Toby Pink got us up and about in the trade period. It covers a need. Dylan Stevens, again, unrequited attention. Pick three, very dodgily came in. 17 and 18. They did really well as well to get rid of their future assistance picks. I like their trade period. They have really bolstered, though, for this pick one. And at the moment, it looks like it's not happening. This is a really interesting one because I don't think it's as good as they say. I would say this is akin to the first sheet, Adelaide, Brisbane. They haven't really lost anything. They've gained stuff, not by their own skill, by the generosity of the AFL. So if you take pick three out of it, 17 and 18, okay, they've done pretty well there. 21, 44 and 65 and the Mickey Mouse picks are there. Then they've got depth. I don't think they're better. I think they've just got depth. Yeah, they are. Uh, where do you start on this? I, I I liked their trade period, but it's kind of the AFL were giving them a 7.5 after also handing them essentially pick three, 17 and 18, and then going, rubbing them on the head and going, good job, guys. That's kind of like giving a participation badge to someone who came dead last in the in the race and going, good job. You did really well. It's like... It's a bit hand-holding. It's a bit disingenuous to say they did well. Having said that, they were able to turn those future picks into picks that they would keep, which is what they had to do. So that's something I guess they get rewarded for that. Fisher's a best 22 player for them. He walks in. He plays in their defense. Uh, Biggie might have to play. Pink will probably have to play just because they have no one else in the key position. I think they delisted Aiden Bonner, so I think they pretty much only have Aiden Core available next year as a key defender. And then Dylan Stevens, I mean, he's an interesting one because they've gone and they've acquired young talent and brought him in, but the one place where they have a lot of talent is the midfield, particularly young guys, so I'm not sure where he actually fits in. So, again, I think 7.5 is probably generous. I'd give him closer to a 6.5 or something like that, but... I don't know, Pom. I don't want to reward them for being bad. Lat dog, what are you collecting in the cases behind you? People, the, the people want uh, to know. Predominantly models that I've painted, predominantly Warhammer that I've painted, a couple of Star Wars figures, a few Carlton bobbleheads up the top, that sort of stuff. But 99% of that is Warhammer I've painted. You know what? Last thing I'll say about North is if you actually get rid of the AFL assistants, effectively they swapped 21, 44 and 65, Ben Mackay and Goldstein for Bigoa, Dylan Stevens, Zach Fisher, and I'll be fair and round up them picks to about a pick 12. And I think if you do that and think of it that way, that is a 5.5. It's an okay period. Yeah, they're 5.5 and then the AFL... Boosted it up generously to a to a six or a seven. It's just it's really hard that, to judge it objectively. I, I I think giving that over six, when giving that over six, I think he's like when Donald Trump said, um, "America needs to start running businesses." I know how tough it is because I didn't have any handouts. I only got a million from my dad to start my yeah, first business. I just had a a small handout of a million dollars. <laughs> It's that. Come on. Um, we'll be doing a giveaway. I'm going to do some exclusive members content in coming up. So we'll get Lek Dog involved. We'll we'll work some giveaways out then. Might give you some sexy things that are modeled behind me. Maybe get Lek Dog to paint you something. 
Oh, hey, thank you, Sophie. But then we come on to Richmond, and Richmond for me, this was probably one that I thought they nailed in terms of the media rating. They lost Soldo and Bigoa and pick 50. They brought in 41 65 Kajitsky and a couple of future pits. Um, the future second is quite appealing, obviously, from Frio because they're going to be bottom three of four, I'd suspect. But a team that I think really needs a rejuvenation. And I felt that Soldo one might bite them in the arse because that Rook now looks really light and they're really backing Tom Lynch to not have these niggles he keeps having him. Yeah, I think you're right. I think I like the Kijitsky pick because he could come in and sort of fill the pseudo fill the Jack Rewalt role. Tom Lynch missed most of last year. If they can both play next year, maybe their situations are not as dire as I've painted. I'm not big on them next year. I think they're going to really struggle. If they lose Big E, that doesn't really matter. I actually think given Soldo wanted to leave, and yes, their ruck line is is now lacking of depth, and Toby Nankervis is never fit. But given what that he wanted to leave, they, they got a fair bit back for him, which I really liked in terms of maximizing the opportunity. The upside for them is nailing the, the future second, nailing pick 41 and, and Kajitsky being a pseudo replacement for Jack Rewalt. That's the upside. The downside is that Soldo goes on to be all Australian, Nankervis gets injured, they've got no backup, and then none of these picks pan out. But for me, yeah, again, another middle of the pack team, but they did address needs. I just don't think it's going to help them next year, really. I think they're going to be bad. I think they're going to be bad. Uh, this is one of them lists that I look at, and it just screams. A couple of injuries could be bottom four. Like that's that's what I look. I just think Lynch gets injured again. Nan Curvis, do you trust Samson Ryan to do a full season on his own? Just feel like a couple of injuries, and that breaks down. That breaks down quite quickly in your you're right at the bare bones. And I feel like, although they won that Soldo trade with what they got back for it, I feel I feel like it's with the picks they had because they went so hard last year. And this is the risk. When you go hard, it can back, bite you in the ass. It can. It can. And I think it will. And I, I mean, uh, maybe I'm just being down on them because they're pricks who won a couple of flags. But I, I just, I see rough times ahead for not for for richmond particularly heading into a period as we've discussed many times bomb where tasmania are going to be involved another one to watch this space and port adelaide i really like this trade period from Port, and i don't know how they did it they went into this trade period with next to no picks they've brought in just about every human being known to man i thought radically uh, I did like that acquisition. I thought it was maybe a little bit overs for what I would have paid. I thought the BZT, though, was a little bit unders. Um, the Soldo deal was probably about the money. John Sweet, I really like that acquisition, though. And and ne nothing pick comes in. Pick 73, their only pick this year. Two future fourths, again. But they didn't really lose anything. The future first, yes, they lost. Xavier Dersma couldn't break in, and they do have a plethora of players, particularly Lachlan Jones, who has been favoured on that wing now, and he has been a shining light. I felt like they've really added that height around the ground down back, but also getting that Ruckman, which Lysette didn't seem to work out last year. I, I, I actually really like this one. I didn't think I was going to. I, I actually liked it in the end. Yeah, I think th this is to me, very similar to Essendon with maybe a little bit more upside, and maybe that's because I trust the Port Adelaide list more than I trust the Essendon list as it's currently constructed. They needed a couple of tall key defenders. BZT probably doesn't have to play lockdown in this team. When when you've got Trent McKenzie as your main key defender at 188 centimetres or however tall he is, bringing in Radigalia and BZT is going to help that. So I think that's a tick. I think Ivan Soldo and Jordan Sweet, I do think there's a world where they play both of them and they're in a pit and net TDK type setup. Worst case scenario, Soldo's number one ruck and Jordan Sweet doesn't play. I think that's an upgrade there. They're clearly rolling to compete again. I think with Soldo and Sweet, it also gives you some security for with Charlie Dixon goes down. They've got Ollie Lord, Todd Marshall, Georgiades, Finlayson, but 
you can also use Soldo in there if you need to. So I'm with you. I like what they did. And it just goes to show that if a player says they want to come to your club in the AFL, they will get there, even if you literally have no way of making it happen. Because as we've seen, <laughs> they've somehow made it happen, bought in four players with literally no assets available to them. I guess it did cost them the upside of Xavier Dersma, which could come back to bite them. But to be honest, once they're off your team, it doesn't really matter what happens. This is a really interesting one. And it does remind me a lot um, when we're talking of, uh, of of the of the trade period that we were discussing earlier, saying that we've, we've, we've slated one trade period that's very similar, Essendon's, and we've complemented this. I, I just think that the players they've got here aren't seriously injured, have been playing regularly, and you kind of know what they're going to get. Soldo, I think he's very underrated, was at Richmond. I've, I've always seen him as a solid performer, rightly behind Nan Curvis, but has done it. John, sweet, had moments. BZT, I thought, was brilliant the last two years, and I'm surprised Essendon didn't well to keep him. And Asava, he's definitely, we've got models of it. Harrison Petty, we've got models of it. Guys that are big and rambustious, and when you just play them as the one-on-one -on -one defender, let BZT go to work. And if they can get that generation out the back line from intercept, Park could be very, very good. Yeah, I think I like the age profile, the guys they bought in. I like, with the exception of Radic Lear, who I don't think is very good. In fact, I don't think BZT is very good, but I think he's been stuck in a position that's probably not the position he needs to play. I think him next to Radigalia and next to Aleli and next to Trent McKenzie becomes a different, more dynamic player. So upside there. But what I like, I think the floor is a lot lower in the players they got versus the floor that say Nessa didn't got. And that's why they had to trade for him. They couldn't just bring him in for free. But yeah, again, it's different. Where your list sits affects how you, we're going to rate what it does because this is a team that thinks they're competing. They're bought in players to help with that competition. They're basically burnt this year's draft and next year's draft. Their goal is to try and win a premiership. Whereas in Essendon, and they're the one I'm going to compare to because I feel very similarly about them that in terms of how they went about the offseason. Essendon aren't competing, and yet they still went and acquired these sort of players. So that that's just for context. That's why I'm higher on a Port Adelaide offseason than I am on an Essendon one. And I, I think that's seven is around the right mark. I think the upside of Soldo alone can push that 8, 9, 10, depending on where he gets to. I think if they get to a granny, it's a 10 as well. If them exactly. players play and they get to a granny, it's a 10. Um, St Kilda, this is one that really annoyed me. So this is like an 8 to a 6, right? I looked at this trade period, and I am an expert in trade periods on paper, look good, in reality is shit, or are going to take a while to pay off. This reminds me of Carlton's 2018 draft trade period, right? Let me take you back, Carlton fans. Um, that was pick 42-71, Alex Fasolo, Mitch McGovern, Will Setterfield, Adelaide's future third, and Nick Newman coming in, right? Now, that's what I see from this trade period. That, that That's what I, a very similar one where one of them will be good, Nick Newman, one of them's going to take a while to pay off in Liam Henry. I feel like Liam Henry is going to be that Mitch McGovern. He's going to tease you and flirt with you. And it's going to take a couple of years until you see the best of him. And the Paddy Dow thing, I feel like they have been really sold on back-end form. And it's the same with drafts. I think it's a disaster if you buy players on the last six months, right? I look at this, Gresham... He's basically Dow, but he can play two positions. Caulfield, I just, I think, I think he's best twenty-two if he can stay fit. I wouldn't have given him up. And Billings basically is Liam Henry if he can stay fit. Do you know what I mean? He's very serviceable, can run through the midfield. I look at this trade period, and honestly, I know the AFL media love it as much as I love Dow, as much as I love Liam Henry. They're they're best they're they're borderline best twenty two players and you've got to get them out and I feel Paddy Dow they've really bought Nick Austin's a genius him and Voss a genius when they played him in the games they played him it, it got them excited I, I feel like they are any better I really do feel like they are any better 
No, me neither. And I, I'm a little lower on, on them than consensus as well for next year. I, I'm not sure where they finish. I think they overachieved this year. Paddy Dow. Look, I, I think the diff, I'm with you. I don't think there's any difference, not necessarily in the positions, but in terms of floor and upside in the players they bought in versus the players they sent out. I think they're all hype picks that haven't made it for one reason or another, right? They're all high-end draft talent, but none of them, whether it's injury or form, have ever been able to cement themselves permanently in a team. I know Gresham's played a lot, but I think that's virtue of of salary and and pending free agency. So the pick 21 probably saves, (laughs) probably helps save them in terms of getting 21 for free, which, again, we don't need to talk about a million times. I don't think they deserve to get... Dow sits, they keep saying he's going to play Jack Steele, Brad Crouch. Is he ahead of either of those guys? Are they going to play him with those guys? We know he needs to play in the, in the inside mid to be effective. Liam Henry comes across. Is he, is he going to play in a wing? They got Brad Hill, Mason Wood, Malera. I know, I guess they swing them into defense. I don't know. It's just a bit of a nothing off season for me. Very similar to the other guys in that they're available for a reason. Available it, for it a didn't- reason. It's interesting as well because they're talking about Darcy Wilson and Caleb Windsor are very high up, so the sources are. And I just think, like, Caleb Windsor, I'm a big fan of him in the draft, but I'm like, he's basically Liam Henry but can go on the ball. And I'd personally rather have Milwera and Caleb Windsor and he develops his inside game. I I would have rather had the players in the draft, to be honest. And then you look at, like, they're talking about Darcy Wilson – bit of line-breaking speed down the back. Uh, I feel like you could have addressed it. This is a very sauce trade period, I will say, mm. where it's one of them ones that only history will judge. Someone put a list together where he's he's drafted, traded for or through free agency or whatever. There's like 12 players that he drafted from other clubs he's acquired from GWS to Carlton and now from St Kilda uh, from Carlton to St Kilda. So that's interesting. I should. I just wanted to say. I meant to say this at the start. I know I come across as sounding pretty negative on most of these teams. I think that's because of the quality of player that's able to move in the AFL. Generally, it's your lower quality players that can move unless they're really high end free agents. So until the player movement system allows more freedom of movement. I think we're going to, I'm going to be always be leaning towards more negative because you're kind of having to turn the 35th player, best player on the list and unearth a gem. So just by way of the way it's structured, I'm always going to be a bit negative. So apologies if I sound too negative on your teams. Fuck that, like dog. They've given some teams 8.5s, mate. <laughs> no, we need some, negativity. but not the right ones, Pom. Not the right ones. That's the issue. <laughs> I, I think this is a bog standard 5.5. Like I feel like it's I a, actually think this is the only team we've talked about, apart from Richmond. I think they've lost more than they've gained. Yep, it, all the upside for them is in basically pick 21, and they've got to nail that. We come to Sydney, and I agreed with this. Like I, I think Sydney's a deceptively good trade period. Deceptively good. I think Taylor Adams. Phenomenal acquisition. I think it's absolutely genius. Genius. A guy that has been moved pillar to post. What a player. They've never looked the same, in my opinion, other than Josh, since they've lost Kennedy. And I feel like Taylor Adams has that hunger, has that hunger, and I think he's that thug-like mentality they need. Brody Grundy, I think he's going to be a dynamo. Um, One Ruckman and one Ruckman only. I am a one Ruckman man. James Jordan, I really liked. I liked him two years ago at Melbourne. I feel like he really compliments them. Uh, Joe Hamlin, I like it. We saw what happened when they had injuries down the back. And I think that makes sense. Dylan Stevens, he went. No one's ever seen him. He managed to blag North Melbourne's future first as well in a back-end deal. Um, They've got some decent picks as well this year in the draft. That looks tasty as well. They've got 12, 45 and 55 which you would suspect will be used to bolster up the rookie A's. Um, They only have two to three list spots on there with that anyway. Brilliant. Absolutely nailed all the holes. And Sydney, very well run team. Yeah, no, these are, if we're calling Gold Coast and Hawthorne the winners of the AFL, Sydney are, are right up there with them. 
somehow turned basically two or three third second round picks and Dylan Stevens into a first rounder. Taylor Adams, Brody Grundy, Joel jo- jo- James Jordan, and Joel Hamling. So, what did we say, Pom, in our preview of them? Well, they needed to address key position depth. Hamling, tick. They needed inside mid depth. Taylor Adams, James Jordan, tick. And they needed a ruckman, Brody Grundy, tick. And they really didn't lose anything to do it. Obviously, there's salary and and list spots and blah blah blah, and there's some injury question marks over Grundy and Adams. But this is a team right now competing for a flag. They were in the grand final two years ago. They had a bit of a dip this year, but still played finals. They're a young team. They've got a great list profile. Now they've added in potentially, let's call it two and a half best 22 players and four best 25, 26 players. So they're going to have depth next year. Callum Mills is going to miss the start of the year, which adds the Taylor Adams value. I'm just, I'm so impressed with them. And I'm so, I just don't understand how every year they do well in the off season and no one looks at them and goes, we well, should do that. Like the the only thing that's ever happened to them, their reward for having good off seasons has been having their cost of living allowance taken away from them and being banned from trading for acquiring Buddy Franklin. Like it's crazy. They're so good. Zane's a big swans boy. Kid and Cleary, correct. That's where them two picks. So you'd imagine 91 remo- is removed to use a rookie, eh? Kid and Cleary. And if they get James Leake, who I'm really hot on, he is like the new Dane Ramp. Got lots of Dane Ramp about him. Sydney will do it. And you've got no doubt that Kid and Cleary, even though he's an outside 40 talent, is probably the next coming of Patrick Cripps. Um, knowing yeah, Sydney 100%. Swans Academy. Um, I don't know how Sydney Swans Academy manages to hide them, but fantastic trade period. Somehow managed to use... It needs to be worth noting. I keep saying this about the draft. I said it last year. Outside of the top 15 talents of this country, the rest are depth players to all about 32. And at a push, you might get them in that top 15 of your list, but they're going to be just be solid, established players. They have got rid of three squad picks and one pick that won for three best 22 players. Like that's a huge, huge win. Huge. Without really costing any future assets. And, you know, you don't know the salaries, so you can't really comment on that. But just... Matt, Na- Matt nails awesome. this as well. I think Grundy is going to be the pickup of the year. Oh, I, I Grundy's really, really, really good. I know he fell out of favour a bit as Collingwood started to prepare for life without him and they used Darcy Cameron and whatnot and then it didn't really work. But look at the games when Gorn was injured last year and Grundy was playing. He was he was beasting. He was beasting. I love Brody Grundy, just quietly. Me too. I'm always a fan. If you're watching, Brods, I got your back, brother. Got your back, mate. Um, this was an interesting trade period for me. Now, I'm glad the Eagles didn't trade pick one, right? I'm glad yeah. because I do... For me, Harley Reid is that damn good. You only trade it for two and three, right? And I'm going to stand by that. You can come at me and say, but Pommy, that's overs. I couldn't give a fuck. When you have pick one and pick 23, pick one has to be two and three. I don't mind if it's two and three for one, 23, and maybe you throw a 30 back, but they can't trade pick one. Flynn, huge tick. Brockman, I like that tip. I, I like that because they've got rid of the way I see it 44 and 63. Two picks that are not going to be used. Brockman is better than anyone post 25 in the draft. Flynn is probably akin to any, any Ruckman in this draft or better. Definitely ready Absolutely. first year. But this is one of them ones that I just feel like when you're in the situation the Eagles are, which really I don't think it's lack of talent, I think it's lack of depth has got them in this mess. That once they have injuries, which they've had catastrophic, they are fucked. They are fucked. I just feel like this was the time to get creative. And I've been hot. Harley Reid is your pick. But I think they should have pushed the agenda with two and three. And I think they should have played some funny business a little bit more. I don't feel like they've been funny business enough. I um, I think they did all right. They added two players that are going to play in their best 22, which is great. Starting Ruckman, which frees up that, that Ruck spot and, and pushes Williams forward uh, if he plays. 
But I'm with you. I think they probably could have done more, but I don't think they want to do it with their draft assets. So I'm going to watch them very closely on the listed free agents. I think there's a number of names that could go to their club and, and play. I'm talking about, your, I don't know, your Haitleys and your Lockie O'Briens and your, I mean, they're not sexy names, Flynn Perez, There, but there is names that, Reese Matheson, like there are guys that could go in uh, and perform. They're very stubborn at West Coast. They tend to play their mature bodies regardless of the situation. Winning two games a year and still playing Luke Shuey in the midfield is interesting, but I, I think we're going to have to see them make some moves. So for me, th this is I'm going to give it like a 5.5 or, or a 6 if we have to give it something because they added two best 22 players. But they need to, as you said, bolster that depth uh, for that to become a 10. Mate, I'm with you. I, I, I feel like they could have got creative. I don't want them to trade pick one. So if you are an Eagles fan, don't come at me. I, I think Carly Reid, brilliant. Back it in. Back back, the, back your culture in. But you've got five or six list spots looking at their list, so they're going to have to use it. You look at the picks they've got outside of that second pick, pick 23, feel like you've got to do something there. You've got to be creative. Got to be creative there. Um, they can't keep Lance Collard, which is a shame as well. I, I feel like they could have been active with next year's picks as well this year and maybe seen a few NGAs, father-sons next year, tried to trick them. Felt like they missed a thing, but it's interesting because this is the next club. This is another club that, like, Doug, you hate the AFL media overrating teams. The <laughs> highest rating was a nine. <sighs> The I mean, I think they the did five. really well to get pick five. Well, the only positive I can see from the dogs is they've tricked the system, and mm. now they will get two bites of provisionally the top ten, top fifteen. Jordan Croft, yeah. and then they've got ahead of him. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. Bravo! You've monopolized the system. But Caulfield, I can't count Caulfield as depth. He's the same as. I just can't count him as depth because he's just never fit. And James Harms, I think he's a great acquisition. But I just look at what they've brought in and look at what they've lost. I just feel like, does Jordan Croft is very good? I, I just feel like this is, they haven't got better. And I feel like if I was the dogs, their list is still primed. I feel like this was the year that you maybe banned her out and McRae. This is, yeah. I felt like, the way the trade period went, McRae has been half forward like Collingwood. They've slotted Taylor Adams half forward. This was the year you go bold, you put McRae on and you say, while you're all pissing about, have a big star. Let's steal some picks. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm with you. I think there's some missed opportunities and maybe that's what lets him down is opportunity cost. Caulfield was basically free and he has some upside. He's never available. <laughs> They don't tend to play their super injury-prone players. Toby McLean couldn't get a game last year, and he's been injured for two or three years. Caulfield's been injured for two or three years. He's not going to get – even if he does get a game, they're gonna, he's a half-backer, so they're going to play him at you know centre-half forward. And James Harms, again, they've got a lot of guys really similar to him in their team. Do they need another okay utility midfielder that can play forward as a defender or in the defensive half-back line? Probably not. Bevo just, I, think, I guess they were just players that they could get to the club. And in that sense, they didn't get worse, but I don't think they got better. I think I do, I did love this specific trader of the three first to get five and, and jump ahead and get a couple of top 15 guys. That's really good. Really like that. But agree for, for them to get to a 10, Nick Caulfield has to reach the potential of being a top 10 draft pick and the two guys they're taking in the draft need to go bang. And for it to be a zero, Caulfield continues to be injured. Harms just kind of floats in and out of the team and they don't hit on any of these picks. So, yeah, I think about uh, but where they've got them ranked, that 5.5 is about right because I think they did smart things, but they're not better. I, I, I look at it and I think, like, I look at their list and I think they've got so many tolls. You've got Darcy, Jamara, Aaron Norton, Buslinger, Jordan Croft to come in. Tim English. I feel like that could have been an avenue as well to sell. Knowing Melbourne have been open about a key forward, Fremantle have been. 
Was that an option that they missed, knowing that one more's coming in? You can't play all of them. I feel like Norton was sellable this year. McRae, I feel like if you, that looked different and that was McRae and there was a future first coming in from another mm. club and maybe another top 10 pick, knowing they'd get two picks in front of Croft this year, I'd be saying 10 out of 10. Well done, boys. Well done. But I just feel that... Feels like this is a let's not do too much because we're not too sure about Bever. That that is yeah. my initial thing. It feels like they haven't done so much. They're just waiting. Yeah, I think so. And I think all the shuffling in that coaching box is indicative of that as well. Well, there we are. I agree with you, Floyd. I mean, if you got that, that's why I say pick one. Two and three. Melbourne don't need it. North Melbourne don't need two and three. Sell it on that. I think two and three is better for them in the long run. Um, but Harley Reid is good. Much love, Dynamic. Well, that is, Christian, we should have traded Lob to Melbourne this offseason. Mate, spot on. Spot sure. on. I think they could have made a play for pick one. I think they fucked it, to be honest. But that's me and Let Dog for this week. We'll be back this time next week. Um, we'll be covering... All your questions, so get them into us. We'll have some fun. But as always, Let Dog, it's a pleasure. And uh, we'll see you all next week. Go Warhammer.